Hey everyone, this is Steve Wantrop with Collider, and I am super happy to be saying uh, hello to everyone out there for uh, Collider's panel on Constantine, the 15th anniversary. As you can see in the windows around on our Zoom call, uh, we have Keanu Reeves, Francis Lawrence, Akiva Goldsman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us in this call today, or this panel, if you will. Thank happy you. to be here, thank you. Uh, can I, I'm gonna start immediately with, uh, what, when was the last time the three of you have done something like this together for Constantine or been in the same room together? Probably wow. not since the film was released. Yeah, probably the premiere. Yeah, I think it might have been the premiere or the junket or something like that. It was the last time the three of us were together. Constantine was one of these projects that was in development at Warner Brothers in the late 90s. Uh, I want to start with Akiva. Uh, how did you first get involved in Constantine? How did this land in your doorstep? I uh, had a deal at Warner Brothers at the time. I was trying to convince people to let me uh, be a producer. The script laying around, um, which was really compelling. Uh, and Lorenzo de Bonaventura and uh, Bob Brassel and I uh, put it together with Nick Cage uh, and Tarsem directing. And um, we started prepping the movie. And then we stopped prepping the movie, and the movie um, went to sleep for a while. Uh, and, uh, uh, and slowly but surely, uh, uh, the idea was durable enough, like uh, many interesting scripts, to outlive whatever struggles it had. Um, and there was this video director who was really something. Um, and... Uh, and so began this research, this restructuring of Constantine, uh, um, with uh, the three of us playing various parts in order to try to uh, get it up and alive again. And it's, I watched it last night um, for the first time in a long time, and it's really cool. <laughs> I want to jump to Keanu. When did you first hear about Constantine and what was it about the character and the material that said, I want to do this? I wasn't familiar with the character. I hadn't, um, I hadn't read Hellblazer or seen any of the Alan Moore stuff in uh, Swamp Thing. Um, so I didn't know the character um, and it was brought to me by my manager at the time, Erwin Stoff. Um, I think when it was brought to me, Akiva and Francis and we're already kind of uh, on board with the project. Is that correct? No, I wasn't. I wasn't on yet. You were on before yeah, no, me. You had, had meetings. you had had meetings. So yeah, I had had meetings. Yeah, but you were you were one of the gauntlets that I needed to pass before. No, no I, I, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I well, yes, I remember that. Yeah, fantastic meeting very well. So I didn't know the character. Um, it was brought to me. Um, really love the script. And once, uh, then I did some research on the character and, um, you know, it was, uh, I was, uh, not hesitant, but you know, I'm not English and I'm not blonde and you know, <laughs> the character is. So I had to reconcile that. And part of that was, well, what was at the, the base of the character? What was, what could I, bring to the character why why even do it and it's such a one of beautiful character this kind of humanitarian cynic kind of tired world weary you know tired of all of the um rules and morals and ethics and angels and de you know but still a part of it um so i and i loved his sense of humor um so i was really excited to you know i I had seen a, a few of um, Francis's videos. Um, I think Lady, the Lady Gaga video was probably the most recent up to it, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. When I went to the meeting to meet with Francis, you know, uh, Francis had all the boards up, you know, it was really kind of, uh, a vision was there of the film, um, which I really loved. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was excited to uh, have the opportunity to, to work with Francis and, and then got to meet with Akiva and, and kind of come up to speed with the team. And um, 
yeah, it was just really, I mean, I love the film. I love the character. So it was, uh, it was cool to be able to play that role and jump into it. Francis, I'm, I'm curious, you had had, you had done so many music videos and were very successful, but you had, this Constantine was your first feature film. I'm yeah. curious, what was it like walking into the studio for the first time and sort of pitching them on why you are the right guy to, you know, this should be your first feature film? Uh, well, that, it, it took a while. I mean, my first meeting was with Bob Brassel, the, the gentleman that Akiva just mentioned, who was an exec there at the time. So the script had been brought to me also by Irwin, who was Keanu's manager at the time. Uh, and so I went in and basically had to convince Bob that I was, that I had a vision for the movie and that I was a responsible filmmaker. I mean, music video guys were not sort of known for being responsible, uh, or thinking about or caring about actors and story. Um, and so I spent a fair amount of time convincing Bob. I sort of got past him, uh, and then had to sort of make the rounds to all the, all the producers. And, you know, Akiva was one of the producers. I think he was in New York at the time. So I flew out to meet with him. Lauren Schuler Donner, who was here in LA, went and met with her. And Keanu, if I remember right, was still finishing shooting the Matrix sequels. Mm. And so he wasn't back from Australia yet. So this was about a nine month process where I was slowly building out this kind of visual presentation, you know, for the movie and meeting with all the producers and executives at, at Warner Brothers. And that all kind of culminated with me meeting with Keanu, I want to say a day or two after you got back from Australia. And we wow. had this, you know, epic four or five hour meeting just talking about the story and the character and, you know, the, the look and other casting ideas and, and all of that. I, I'm very curious how nervous were you, Francis, after all this time and energy you'd spent getting ready for that meeting with Keanu? Because ultimately, that meeting doesn't go well. You're not, you're not doing the move. No, I was, look, I was, I was very nervous. There was, there was, you know, a ton of work into the presentation itself. I had already started having story meetings with Akiva, so there were already some of my ideas that were, you know, integrated into the script. So that would have been a, it would have been a giant, giant bummer. Um, and look, I was a first, I was a first time feature director and a music video guy. So there's, you know, there were, there were definitely things to overcome. This was not, uh, there was real convincing that needed to be done with every single person I met along the way. This was being made in 2004, I believe, came out in 2005. At the time, the comic book movie genre was not what it is today. And I think right before that you had, um, Brian Singer's X-Men, you had Sam Raimi's Spider-Man that were sort of setting the tone of the genre. Uh, well, this new version of the genre, if you will. How much did those films, do you remember sort of dictating what you wanted to do with this? Or were you looking at other films that had come before and said, we want to do this, we don't want to do that? Um, I definitely wasn't looking at comic book movies as references. I mean, in all honesty, I was I was looking at noir films. You know, I would look at something like Blade Runner over any other kind of comic book movies uh, or, you know, The Third Man or Maltese Falcon and, you know, things like that because there was just a huge noir um, tone and influence in the story and the characters and uh, I wanted it to influence the aesthetic of of the film itself. So I, I watched a lot of uh, films like that as opposed to other comic book movies. Uh, I am also curious, you were making this film around the same time that Nolan was making Batman Begins at the same studio. Were they trying to make sure both films were different? Did it, did it really matter what he was doing? Uh, did that come up at all? In all honesty, I think Warner Brothers didn't care that much about the movie at the time when we when we were making it it all changed when they saw the first cut uh which was an amazing thing to see there was sort of a transition of power right as i got the job to make the movie so the people sort of at, at the top and the executive level inherited the project and kind of went along with it um but i don't think they had much faith in it until the cut so i i really wasn't getting noted by the studio at all and we were doing something that was weird as francis said it was noir it was stylish it was horror um and it was comic book but you know comic book is you can have comic book horror and you can have comic book science fiction and you can have comic book romance and, and so we were doing a thing that was atypical um at least thus far um once it started to roll out 
I mean, you know, it's sort of from the first frame of the movie, you suddenly go, oh, I'm in sure hands. Like somebody is going to move me through a story. I, what movie am I watching? You know, and that's sort of once Francis gets you, all right, and he carries you to Keanu. And then there's Keanu. I mean, you know, that hallway and that kid, that the, the, uh, the uh, possessed girl who's not a kid but looks like a kid. You know, you just suddenly are in for a ride um, and not one you necessarily expected. So I think that's when the studio kind of went, hmm, perhaps we should pay attention to that. Yeah, I remember I remember we actually cut together. It was about a 25 minute sort of sizzle reel for the movie. It was before the movie was actually cut and had a screening. That's probably the most nervous I was on the entire movie. And we were showing all the executives and the new president uh, at, at Warner Brothers. And that's when everything changed. Suddenly we were on the radar. Suddenly they were excited about us. Um, and it sounds weird because it was not a cheap movie to make, um, but it's true. We were sort of off their radar until until that screen of that, that footage. And weirdly enough, my first time at Comic-Con, we screened that exact same 25 minute sizzle reel. It was the first time in Hall H and we put it up there and you're backstage and you hear the whole thing. And we went out and did this panel for for Constantine, which was it was very cool, but it was that same exact sizzle reel that we we showed the studio. And 15 years later, you're at Comic-Con at home. Exactly. <laughs> Downtown Los Angeles plays such a role in this movie, and it adds so much. It's, it, you know, it's a character. One of the great things that Keanu did very early on was we had set the story in Los Angeles. And it's still not often that you actually get to shoot in Los Angeles. But I think, Keanu, if I'm right, you actually put it in your deal that we had to do it in LA. You were not going to go to Toronto or Vancouver or Atlanta or one of these places to cheat it for LA. We were really oh. in LA. <laughs> so that was great. So that, that battle was done, you know, long before we got the green light, which was fantastic. Um, I love LA and I love filmic LA. And, um, yeah. So I love being on the streets, I like the way the weather changes. I like the early dawn, the deep night, um, color of the lights, people, people who are on the street. It's got a good vibe. Um, and I think, you know, maybe as soon, I want to bring it up as soon as possible, but you know, it's Philippe Rousselot's the cinematographer. Yeah, he did. He did a fantastic, <laughs> yeah, fantastic job. And Naomi Shohan, the production designer as well. And because, because we set the story in LA and we got to shoot it thanks to Keanu in LA, um, I actually chose Naomi because she had done training day and I really loved all the location work and the, the set design and decoration that she did in training day. Um, and and I saw that she wasn't, you know, this wasn't about going to the sort of L.A. landmarks like, you know, the Santa Monica Pier or the Hollywood sign. It was like getting into real L.A., like parts of, you know, Koreatown and Echo Park and, you know, parts of downtown that, you know, people hadn't shot in that much and things like that. And so she was she was great with all that. You know, shout out to Frank Capello as well, who yes. was kind of like this, you know, yeah, in, in the in the in the in the roots of the tree. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And Kevin Broadbent. And yeah. What? yeah. No, there, was good team, there was good team spirit on, on this movie. I have to say it was my first. And so I got, spoiled. I got a little spoiled. Yes. By, by how, how much love the, the whole cast and crew had for the project and the, the sort of spirit and energy everybody had going forward. Um, and, uh, it's not like that on, on everything. Um, and you don't need sort of too many, you know, spoiled apples to kind of ruin, ruin the mood. And this, this team did not have that at all. It was, it was great team spirit the whole way through. Um, something that, uh, Keanu, I've seen you work on set a few times and I've heard ever, so many stories about how awesome you are and how gracious you are to the crew. What's, how have you managed to keep yourself so grounded, or have you ever come close to not being as grounded and awesome as you are now and sort of caught yourself? Uh, that's uh, kind of you to say, Steve, but uh, um, I don't know, I just, I love what I do and I like going to work and I like being creative and, and we're all in it together. So, you know, just uh, 
go 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 play make some have some fun sure i, I just want to for for people that are watching um i did a set visit on neon demon i don't think you were working that day keanu and you came in to talk to us rode a motorcycle to set hung out and then took off trust me when i say out of all the movies i've done set visits on this is not the norm at all well i mean whatever man i just uh you know just whatever i i can't speak about you know anyway but um yeah i mean we had a a really wonderful well i'm sure you have got questions about it but the the cast and i think to what francis was saying everyone really loved the material and and loved working with francis and and uh anyway sure i'm going to continue with my a shout out to the operator mark labange yeah good one nice right? call back. yeah mark labange he did a great job on that right yeah. it's something that you know I'm, and it was actually one of those experiences on a film you you, you kind of get a relationship with not only the you know the production design the cinematography the mise-en-scene you know the character and stuff but the world that you're moving in and then the relationship between the operator and the first AC, you know, especially when you're doing a picture like, or a role like Constantine, you really work hand in hand in the ballet of, you know, the vision of the director and trying to make the shapes and hit the marks and let people know ahead of time where you're going. And, and Mark LeBonge is amazing. And our first Josh McLaughlin, who's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and Pam, yeah. Pam was the first AC. Pam, the first AC, and yeah, Daryl, but... Daryl on do the dolly grip. Yeesh. Those Atlanta boys. Killers, killers. <laughs> A great LA crew, man. Ah, oh, best in the world. Anyway, probably at the heart of why Keanu put LA in his deal, which is if you're gonna shoot LA for LA, and you're actually there the city starts to help inform every piece of the production. Did you ever discuss having another character from Vertigo, from DC, in the movie, or was it always just going to be Constantine? Wait, you got Midnight? You got Chaz? What are you talking about? Well, you, right now, when you have these, true, I, absolutely true, but what you have nowadays with the genre is you're always trying to connect to this bigger universe, if you will. And while you, you touch on that with the characters you just mentioned, you're not in the overarching, you know, DC storyline or this huge, you know, like you don't have Superman flying in, if you will. Um, and I'm just curious if you ever, if there was ever any talk about bringing in other DC characters. Not while I was on. While I was on, the the, the focus was on Constantine and, and Constantine's world. So all the characters that surround him but yeah not sort of weaving in any of the other kind of classic D dc heroes cool um the movie ended up being released as a rated r but it was to me like a pg-13 movie that was just over the line um when did you find out it was going to be rated r and did you ever battle the MPAA to try to get PG-13? Originally, when we all started on this, we, th we thought it was going to be a rated R film. Uh, Warners then dictated that it had to be PG-13 because of what it cost. And we actually kind of followed. We got this sort of list of guidelines of what you can do and you can't do in uh, a PG-13 movie. And we followed those rules to AT. I mean, the amount of times you can say the kinds of nudity, the blood, the violence, all of those things. And we screened it for the MPAA. And I mean, I remember hearing that they got about five minutes in and put their notepads down and said that we got a hard R for tone. And so this is not something that's on the list, but basically there's this sort of, I think it was an overwhelming sense of dread was what I heard that they had from the opening scene onward. And they, they didn't think there was anything that we could do about it. Basically what we had was a PG-13 movie that got an R rating. And so, which just killed me because it's like, if we were gonna get an R rating, I would have made an R rated movie. <laughs> you know, we could have like really gone for it in, in terms of intensity and, you know, violence and language and all those kinds of things. But we, we got a bit screwed on that, on that front. And we did try to fight, but um, we obviously didn't win that battle. It's, uh, do you think if it was released today, it would still get an R for tone? Or do you think that the things of the goalpost has moved? 
there's a kind of weird subset of uh, religious horror. And uh, that seems to get an R much more quickly. What you learn is that despite the fact that there are guidelines, it's a purely subjective interpretation. And that there, and that subjectivity has sort of like, it ebbs and flows based on the group that is uh, designating the rating. But very, we have a lot of demons. Demons seem for some reason to trigger an R rating. There you have it. I've now given every prospective filmmaker the key to getting an R rating. Just have demons. <laughs> right. uh, Keanu, throughout the entire film, you are either being rained on or smoking a cigarette. Uh, which was more of a pain in the, ass, the cigarettes or the rain? What do you mean pain? Man, that was fun. <laughs> what are you talking about. Keep there, were a, there were a couple of days where Keanu turned green, where we did enough takes where you know he was he, he kept having to smoke those fake cigarettes and. Oh yeah, the smoke for the the, the spider and the glass. The spider. That's right. Whoa. But we got the shot. Keanu also gave me this. Oh, yes. Oh, oh the yeah. shotgun! <laughs> yeah! Uh, the best rap gift I've ever gotten on a movie. Keanu actually had the prop guy make a second one of these. It's, it's made of bronze. This thing weighs probably 35 pounds. It's, it's insane. So yeah, that, awesome. Do you yeah. have the other one? No. <laughs> I think it's probably just in a, you know, in a Raider, uh, Raiders of the Ark-like warehouse at Warner Brothers or something, the other one. I really so enjoyed working with Francis and Akiva, but also, you know, just having Francis's vision, having Akiva's story sense and humor and experience, um, you know, really. And then the crew that was assembled and, the, and then the cast. You know, and, and, and playing that role, you know, I get to, to have these great moments with all of the characters in the film, you know? So throwing down with Peter Storm Mare as I'm bleeding out and he's leaning into me and he's like lighting my cigarette, you know? And like that confrontation with all white with the black or throwing down with Tilda Swinton and she's choking me. Hello, John. John, with her foot on my throat, you know, working with Shia LaBeouf and like just, you know, his dying scene or even, you know, working with Jaiman Hongsu and just, you know, I love that moment when he starts to pray and Constantine is just like, Ugh. you know, but then the scene with Jaiman and I when he's, you know, doing the water and I'm getting my, taking my shoes off, um, you know, Max Baker, Going, I mean, there was just so many, um, what was the cat's name when it, in the opening of the film? Pruitt? Pruitt, Pruitt Taylor Vince, yeah. Yeah, the cast, and there's so many, the dialogue is so juicy and the scenes are so, you know, that hard boiled thing, that mystery, you're walking in, you don't know. And then, you know, for me in the opening of the film, you know, we kind of shot and we were there and just like leaning back on a bed and holding up a mirror and like being flat to the ground, like, you know, there was just so many times getting to work with such extraordinary artists and we were all just having fun. I mean, the dialogue and the costumes were great and the production design was great. And the crew, I mean, no one was like, everyone came in, rolled up their sleeves. It was collaborative. Everyone contributed, you know, working with Rachel. Um, Rachel Weiss was, you know, it was the second time I'd had a chance to work with her. So we had a shorthand. Um, you know, working nights, working days, Philippe Rousselot walking on a set. Um, in the, I don't, yeah. Uh, so for me, it's those moments of just, you know, working with Peter, working with, like, as I said, with, with Tilda and everybody, there's just, I look on those moments. And then walking into those buildings and having them and, um, and shooting on film. <laughs> <laughs> Francis, this, yeah. was your first, this was your first film. Did you feel like any additional pressure to deliver something like cool and stylized and sort of, you know, demonstrate your look as a director? Because uh, when I was rewatching it, something that I, I sort of forgot about were how many cool shots are in this film and the way you use slow motion and the way the rain comes down and the angles. Like, 
you, you made a lot of really great choices. And I'm curious, how, how much pressure did you put on yourself to make something that would stand out like that? I mean, you know, in all honesty, the pressure I felt was to focus on the story, get the story right, and to work with the actors. I feel like I wanted to focus on story and acting um, and let the sort of 10, 10, 12 years of doing music videos sort of be second nature and have the style part, you know, come secondary to story and character. It's a visual art and I like the visual side of things and I think in images. Um, and so I enjoy the, the world building aspect of, of movie making. Um, and so I definitely leaned into that, but I, I felt the pressure to focus on the other things because I think everybody expected for me to be able to make things look good. Um, and I think people were worried that I wouldn't uh, focus on story and character. This film had an after the credit scene and this was released back in 2005. The way you guys did it was well before the MCU with Iron Man in 2008. I'm curious, how did you end up with the after the credit scene? And was there any pressure to not include it? You know, like, because that, it wasn't the norm like it is now with so many movies with after the credit scenes. The, the after the credit scene was Akiva's idea, um, which I thought was very cool. And one of the reasons, and that was not part of our initial shoot, it wasn't part of our sort of initial photography. After we had that screening of that sizzle reel and we got the studio really excited, Akiva and I kind of went back to them and said, hey guys, now that you're excited, you know, there's a couple of other things we want to do. I'd really love to reshoot this club sequence and we'd really love to do this thing at the end, uh, at the, after the credits, Akiva has this idea. And they said, great, go ahead. And they gave us you know, a, a decent amount of money to go get additional footage. Um, but yeah, that was all, that was Akiva's idea. There's not a lot of explanation about anything. So it was a way of closing that story, uh, opening up other stories, should we ever have gotten to do them. Um, you know, just again, in a sort of way that made sense to us, was relatively oblique compared to how things are typically laid out, but it was fun. One of my favorite lines in the movie is there's the, the scene right before Keanu goes into hell and he's in Rachel's apartment and he has her fill up this pot with water and sort of, you know, and oh, and sees the cat, right? And he sort of puts the cat in his lap and he's sort of looking at it. And the way he held the cat's face also made everybody in the audience, um, I guess because there was this overwhelming sense of dread, thought he was gonna <laughs> like feel the skin off the cat's face or something. Line makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely. I know what it means. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, it, but, but in, the, in the world of Constantine, it, it totally makes sense. And you just buy that he has ways of doing things and he understands things and has connections to different things. And what's one of my favorite little moments in the movie. Was it supposed to be hot or cold? In front of the chair. I can't believe I'm doing this. Is this all of Isabel's things? Yeah. How about the cat? Duck? Yeah, why? Duck. Oh, you think that's strange? Cats are good. Half in, half out anyway. some kind of spell or something. Don't you need candles and a pentagram for it to work? Why, do you have any? This is crazy. Yes. I need you to leave. I'm sorry. Angela, please. The apartment. Careful with that cat.
God, I hate this part. When I first read the script, Hell was sort of uh, an inky black void. I felt like I'd seen it before, and so I wanted to kind of come up with a, with a different idea. And I also wanted to play with the idea of time uh, when going to either heaven or hell. And so I actually pitched Akiva this idea that, you know, when you go to hell, right, because this would be sort of a sense of eternity, that if you were to sort of come back, it's almost like no time has gone by at all, but you could have been there for you know, minutes or days or years, let's say, in hell, and only a millisecond has gone by in the real world, which is why we did all the slow motion. So the idea that she's just leaving the room, he's going into hell just as she's starting to shut the door, and we shot with photosonics, and I think we shot about 360 frames a second or something like that for, you know, the little wind on Rachel's hair and the door shutting and, you know, all of that. Um, and then for the idea of hell, so it wasn't just a void, um, and to try and come up with a new concept, I liked the idea of giving either heaven or hell a geography, right? And, and coming up with this idea that wherever you are at any given moment, there is a hell version of where you are, and there's a heaven version of where you are, right? And so if John Constantine is sitting in this apartment and he's going to go into hell, he's going to go into the hell version of Los Angeles, Right. So we set her apartment next to the, you know, 101 freeway. So he's going to sort of climb out and climb up onto this freeway that can get him to this hospital where all these kind of husks of cars are and things like that. So it just gave it all uh, a, a sense of geography and some relief and grounded it a little bit instead of it just being this kind of blank void. Um, I want to say one. I want, I want yeah, to jump ahead. in and say one thing about that because it's it's Francis's idea, and it's such an amazing idea. Hell has geography in Constantine. There's Hell L.A. There's Hell Des Moines. There's Hell Brooklyn. There's Hell your mother-in-law's house, and they all exist. There's a whole planet of Hell, a whole world, an Earth that is Hell, and that's extraordinary because suddenly Hell got to be new. You know, it got to be um, entirely unexpected. Uh, and Francis is right. In the original script, it was just like, it was the same hell everybody had been to, but black and white, I think. It's something to think about. It's disturbing and lovely. The VFX supervisor and I looked at a lot of nuclear bomb test footage, right? So this kind of colorized stuff. And so what we what we really liked is that that moment when the sort of, first kind of wave of heat hits a structure and you sort of get this super high wind heat incineration all happening at the same time and decided that that's kind of what hell should be like, right? And so when you go down there, you've got that kind of incinerator, um, forest fire, nuclear, um, you know, sort of color space. You've got that wind, you've got the sort of heat distortion and turbulence in the air um, just to make it really, really a nasty place to be. Keanu, do you remember filming that sequence specifically with the cat? Oh, in the room. Yeah. I mean, I remember being in hell and I remember being in the apartment <laughs> and I remember the cat. I didn't know what I was going to do with the cat until I met the cat and the cat told me what to do. Um, uh. Yeah, exactly. That's what it was. It was just that little curl like that where you just sort of pulled it back. Well, and the first exactly. test screenings, you could see the audience was like, oh, no, what's <laughs> <gonna do?" laughs> 
cat eye. Sometimes we didn't know what we were going to do, but there's, we would just go do it. So, I mean, it was, yeah, getting the water. I mean, also, I think that scene plays to a lot of what you're talking about. If you include the hell sequence, I also love that the demons had their brains gone. So the seed of the soul had been scooped out like an urchin, like eating an urchin, you know? So that was interesting too and fun. And the way that their joints move backwards. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and then kind of like running and running machines, trying to get that stuff and then doing the wire jump. That was fun. But that sequence has, you know, half in, half out, has all of the hard boiled, has the humor, has the cinema, has the vision, has the writing, has the playfulness, has that dread. Um, it has what's, that, what's going to happen. So that, that sequence, you know, if you go into it and then come, go to hell and come back out and the door click and her hair and coming back and then coming back to John and the steam coming off his back and he's, you know, and the physical cost, the toll that it took him. Um, and then, and then the drama, the flip, you know, how that's like the sister and the reveal and, and then the kind of momentum of the storytelling and the performance that Rachel gives and the intimacy of that, you know, you're getting spectacle intimacy. It feels real. Um, and yeah. It's One of the things I think that the film does so well is it has a lot of really cool character moments, but then out of the blue, something action-y will happen or it'll be edge of your seat and then you're back to character moments. And it always, it never does it like, um, with a lot of movies, you know there's gonna be a thing in the first act, second act, third act. And this movie, it's throughout the entire film. It's always keeping you guessing. That was part of the idea, was to always be a bit surprising. Um, one of the things that I learned from Akiva that I've tried to carry through in every everything that I've done was, I think a mistake that some people make, especially with, let's say, scares or surprises and things like that is that often you go you enter in a scene as a filmmaker you enter in a scene specifically to surprise and it doesn't work that well unless you feel like you're in another kind of a scene right you have to be in a scene where something's happening where you're drawn in through a character moment or some sort of relationship dynamic connection something where you feel like you're there not because the scare is coming Right. And then when the scare sort of comes in or something action y comes in, it's surprising. Um, where often people just kind of you move into that room so that thing, that scary thing can happen. And I think people and audiences kind of sniff that out instantly. Was there any talk at the time of doing a sequel or did it ever come up? Not come up? Yes. Oh my God. It, yes. Endlessly came up. Boy, we wanted to. We wanted to make a hard R sequel. We wanted to, we, oh God, yeah. I mean, I think we'd probably make it tomorrow. I mean, it, yes, we tried uh, a lot of different ways to find, um, it was always to, to the studios who made it, which were Village Roadshow and um, Warner Brothers. It was always a little bit of a feathered fish. Um, it's oddness, the thing that you're talking about, which I do think is one of the most lovely things about the film, the way it is equally comfortable in a character scene between Keanu and Rachel as it is with demons flying, hurling themselves at a man who's going to light his fist on fire and, and expel them. Um, is odd, right? It's not really action-packed. It just has a bunch of action. This movie isn't exactly a thing. It's kind of a few things, which is, I think, what's beautiful about it. But those seem to get harder and harder to make. Uh, and even then, uh, I think much as we wanted to. And we've talked about it, and we've had ideas. And, and I would love that one of, like, he wakes up in a cell. He has to identify the prisoner. Is that Frank's idea? Remember, and it was Jesus. And then he, I think he comes up because you think it's Beirut. He's in New York. I mean, you know, there, there were, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, just yeah, we talked about. Yeah, it. we would definitely. I mean, but I, I will say that you know, we, we, we definitely talked about sequels. I think more than the studio, um, because you know, the movie did fairly well, and this was also still a time when people sold DVDs, so I think it did decently um, at the time but it wasn't a knockout success and it also wasn't really sort of critically acclaimed by any means at the time. I mean, the kind of cool thing for me about this movie is just 
you know, in the 15 years since it released, every time I do a movie and I go out and travel the world and do junkets, I am signing Constantine D DVDs more than any other movie that I've done. I mean, over the years, different countries, I'm, people really, really love this movie. Um, and I think that it's, it's like found a sort of a new, a new life in a weird way. And I mean, I even see articles where people, you know, even like Rotten Tomatoes posted an article about, you know, apologizing to Constantine for, you know, the Rotten Tomato count that it had. It just, and, and I think people have sort of discovered it recently, weirdly. Um, it's, it's always kind of had its kind of cult fan base, which has been great, but I think people have sort of discovered it in a new way. So I think we always loved it more than the studio loved it. A lot of people don't realize Michelle Monaghan originally had a big part, well, not a huge part, but a role in this. And she had a physical relationship with Constantine. She was peppered in, in Midnight's Club. She had a bunch of scenes. Uh, can you sort of talk about what, original, what her role was? And also, Francis, what is it like calling an actor who has delivered solid work and is in a bunch of the movie and saying, by the way, um, yeah, we had to cut you out completely. Yeah, well, the it, it sucked calling her. Um, I think, you know, we had real story reasons for, for, for doing it. It was not her performance. She's a fantastic actress um, and really liked the work that she did. And we just, you know, she, Constantine was in a relationship, I would say, with Michelle's character in the movie. And we decided that Constantine was better alone. Um, and feeling like he didn't have a companion that he could sort of lean on and have a relationship with. Um, when we got to shoot the extra footage, because we liked Michelle so much and the character she played so much, we actually tried to fashion new scenes. So the problem was I had to tell her that we were cutting all of her scenes before we got to do this pickup stuff. I, we then, Kiva and I came up with some new scenes and said, hey, we've got some new ideas. We're, we're going to shoot some new stuff with you. And she's like, great. And she came in and we shot it and tried it and it didn't work. And I had to call her again a second time to say. And the, the worst part was the only piece that stayed in the movie was this, this moment at the end where Constantine lights the sprinklers and um, which starts spraying the holy water and she gets hit and starts to burn. And she says, you know, surprised, holy water? And she hated that line. She hated that line. She hated that moment. And it ended up being the only moment of her in the movie after sort of two attempts at various scenes. But she, again, fantastic actress. This was, it was purely a story, story thing that, uh, that made us cut her from the movie. Was there ever any talk about you doing blonde hair and like a British accent? Or was it sort of like... No. <laughs> Got it. I, I was always curious about you doing blonde for the uh, for the movie, but it's not important. No. Yeah. no, yeah, we never, no, we never, we never talked about it. Um, and then I remember in costumes too. The one other sort of big change for the Constantine character was the coat. Um, and we did try the sort of Constantine coat and ended up going with the black one, which is you know different from the from the character from the comic books and the graphic novels. Um, so we just we wanted to do what was sort of right for what we were doing. My last question for you guys, uh, ultimately the editing room, the test screening process can rewrite an entire movie. Um, can you sort of talk about what you learned from test screenings uh, besides Michelle Monaghan's character that maybe impacted the finished film? They were sort of slightly inconclusive kind of test screenings, right? That, you know, yeah. sometimes you get a thing where you feel this big wave of people saying like, your ending sucks or some, you know, something like that, or something's really confusing. Religion is a very polarizing element in storytelling, right? Because there's people that are very religious and might get offended by something. Then there's people that aren't religious at all and they feel like they're getting preached to. I remember being in a Q and A after a screening and um, somebody, I don't remember what religion he was, but he was, so confused by heaven and hell and trying to get me to explain because in his worldview and religious view, there was no heaven and hell. So how is he supposed to sort of enter into this world appropriately, right? And he was really confused. And I think that that was one of the big takeaways was that just the subject matter of the, of the story um, was putting some people off. Do you remember that alternate credit sequence we built out? Yes. With, like their pasts, all of them when they were together, 
uh, I wonder what ever happened. That never made any of the DVDs or anything, did it? I don't know. I don't know. I could look for it. I think I still have those Polaroids. You remember that Keanu when I was like, I had that little Polaroid camera and we spent like two or three days of me shooting Polaroids of you guys like investigating crime scenes, you and Jimon and yeah, yeah, yeah. zombies underneath the Santa Monica Pier, things like that. <laughs> I'm sure there's some people who are watching who have actually never seen Constantine. Um, now is the perfect time to watch Constantine. Uh, you will be, uh, you will have an awesome ride. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to Keanu, Francis, and Akiva for joining uh, us today for this panel on a look back at Constantine. Uh, and thank you so much to Comic Con, Comic Con at Home, for letting us uh, put this together. And uh, gentlemen, I want to say thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Comic Con at Home. So good to see you, Francis and Akiva. <laughs>